Throughout 1944, the glider was the only major escape plan, employing a team of over 40. Raw materials, though, were running out. Bedboards provided excellent timber, but there was a limit to how many one could sacrifice. The bed sheets were also in demand. Faithfully following the original, cotton gingham covers the skeletal frame of the replica glider. And to make it aerodynamic, it has to be stiffened or doped. In Colditz, they concocted a unique recipe from their meager rations to make the starch. When we doped the, the fabric, that was um, quite an exercise up here, wasn't it? It was, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, we used millet, which we'd been given by the Germans to eat. And we found if we ground it up with a sort of mortar Boy. and pestle device, we could boil it up afterwards and use it as a dope on the um, blue and white check. I say, I think it's incredible. I've never seen it before. Um, it's got everything that we're seeking there, but we won't use it because for air witness um, requirements, we'll use cellulose dope. And you can hear that it's just a little bit tighter. I mean, how far did they have to fly? A thousand yards? That would have lasted easily. Well, it's very, very interesting to see how small the workshop was now. Exactly. Because, I mean, the, the, the tailplane stood about this high, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. The rudder and... Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And towards the end, of course, when we'd got all the fabric on the damn thing, you had to be pretty careful where you stepped. Yeah. Um, because there wasn't a hell of a lot of room, as you can see. Despite the crowded conditions, a space was found in the workshop for a young army officer with a singular idea. An escape plan that was to make him the last man to get out of Colditz. During his five years as a POW, John Beaumont's nickname was Hornblower. This is because whenever he tried to escape and was then sent to another camp, his French horn was allowed to follow him. I think they felt they were stopping us escaping by interesting us in music. You see, which, which <laughs> we were interested in music, but we still wanted to escape. Personally, I wanted to escape because I was hungry. <laughs> uh, and also, it was, it, you know, you, 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 this was what you were meant to do if you were captured. You wanted to escape and be able to fight again. At the eastern foot of Colditz Castle is the Tear Garden. The POWs were taken down here under guard to exercise. John's idea was to make a break on the walk back by diving onto a rubbish heap and hiding under a blanket. I first got to know that he was thinking about this sort of thing because he used to come up to the theatre and wander round and round the theatre floor with a blanket over his arm and then suddenly fling himself on the floor and draping the blanket over himself at the same time. And as we were messing together, I eventually asked him what the hell was going on. It was some old bit of, bit of, sort of material, sort of canvas -y kind of thing. I goodness knows where I picked it up. Um, and um, I had to sew a lot of things onto it. Sort of rubbish you f might find lying by the side of the road, something. I was told that dogs didn't like the smell of garlic, and so I got hold of some garlic and smothered it with garlic, too. And so anyhow, it was a, known by my friends as a syphilitic camel. I heard the Alsatian coming up. I thought, oh, golly, this this will be it because the dog will sniff it out. But whether the Garlic prevented the dog to it. I don't know. Anyhow, he passed by. Two miles outside of Colditz was a forest. John hoped to wait there until dark before risking the 70 mile walk to Czechoslovakia. However, patrols had been alerted to an escape from the castle. These two um, 
stopped their bicycles and asked, asked me who I was and so on. And so in, in French, I replied that I was a Belgian worker on parole and produced a certificate to say that I was. They said, ha ha, you must be from Kolitz. <laughs> The standard punishment for escaping was 28 days in the cooler. While John Beaumont was serving out his time, rumors were spreading about an Allied invasion. Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, a new phase of our air bombing has begun. Those of you who can leave the towns in the 35-kilometer coastal belt now... As soon as the news was delivered around the world, so it was around the prison camp. The gamblers started laying bets on when the war would end. Suddenly, the cry, home by Christmas, didn't sound so hollow. This is what the Colditz glider would have looked like in September 1944. But their workshop, unlike ours, did not provide the room to fit it together. John Lee, the pilot builder, has just finished making the wings. That's, that's, a, that's the first link. Up. They contain over 6,000 hand-shaped components. And we have no adjustments to make whatsoever. We've got far more travel than I could have hoped for. And that'll be crucial in the uh, flying of this machine. It's really nice. The original glider was almost complete. But work was halted because of events outside of the castle. What became known as the Great Escape was a mass breakout from another POW camp at Sargon, northeast of Kolditz. 76 RAF and American airmen had got out through a tunnel, but only three got home. Of the remainder, Hitler ordered 50 to be selected at random and executed. In an attempt to justify these murders, the Germans warned that from now on, anyone attempting to escape would be shot. After the escape, uh, the, there were orders from London, direct orders from London to moderate. The end of war was coming and it's no use losing more people unnecessarily. That order was passed to all the camps, as far as I know, to Kolditz, to Stalagluf III, and probably mo most of them. So, when we got to Kolditz, there was still plenty of action, but there was no escapes. But there was one man at Kolditz who was not prepared to sit out the war. He was the most prolific escaper of World War II, spending as much time on the run in Germany and Poland as he had in prison camps. His fame as an ace escaper preceded him. The Germans dubbed him the Red Fox. In the two years Mike Sinclair had been in Kolditz, he'd made three bids for freedom, each one months in the planning. The most audacious was disguising himself as a German officer. But he was shot and injured in the attempt. Now, two days after the grim warning from the enemy, he was ready to try again. Monday, September the 25th. I was sitting in the bedroom, writing at Martin's table, a letter to my mother. The time was just before three o'clock. When a fusillade of shots with much shouting came from the park. It was old Mike making his last and most daring escape. The bullet ricocheting off his elbow and passing through both lungs to that gallant, sturdy heart. No one has tried harder than he in this war to do his duty, despite the many difficulties, disappointments and setbacks with which he had been faced during four long years. There was no one more loyal and straight than Mike, and though he was not always an easy person to get on with, he was always a very true friend to me, and by his death, the regiment has lost a very gallant officer. 
I obviously was feeling it, wasn't I, very much at that time when I read it. There were no more escape attempts from Kolditz. By winter 1944, Germany was in retreat and the country was in chaos. The Red Cross parcels couldn't get through and the prisoners of war were desperately short of food. I think we all develop ways of sleeping uh, to get over the worst pangs and the normal one was to sleep with one's clenched fist, sleep on your face with a clenched fist in your stomach so that at least the walls of your stomach weren't sort of flapping uselessly but uh, felt that they had something in. There was a library there but a lot of the pages were torn off, torn out. It would be describing either a sausage roll or something. It would be something to do with the food. You'll get two chaps walking round, weakly round the exercise thing, saying, do you remember that lovely steak we had at Simpson's? Oh, it wasn't anything like the lobster termidor I had so-and-so. Drooling with saliva and not a hope of getting anything. Sources of protein were hard to find, and the POWs couldn't rely on their captors to provide meat for the table. The pigeons were difficult. They would come only if you offered them a lot of food, and that wasn't uh, available very often. Any bird, even sparrows, were fried. I got a, a, some meat with a bone in it. Now, that was wonderful. A bone, you know, after three years. <laughs> and, you know, made the most of it. And uh, I remember going back the next day, and John Watton said, how did you get on, John? Oh, I said, a good meal, John, a bone in the meat, wonderful. And then he said, uh, have you heard? I said, no. He said, the English cat's missing. We skinned it and we boiled it up. We boiled it up with some lentils. It's a very greasy meal, actually, cat. But I mean, it filled a, an empty spot. When the mainland was invaded in June that year, everyone thought they'd be home by Christmas. For some, it was their fifth year since becoming a prisoner. Inside the courtyard, it was seven below, and Flight Lieutenant Cheko Chalupka, a true gentleman, was paying the penalty for losing the bet he'd made back on D-Day. Throughout the first months of 1945, the Allies continued to push into Germany from east and west. In Kolditz, the prisoners were monitoring the advance, but they were unsure who would be the first to arrive, Americans or Russians. I was, on this famous weekend towards the end of April, here at this window, preparing the lunch, such as it was, and looking out, as of my custom, across this expanse of countryside, I suddenly noticed, just to the left of that line of trees there, a blob or two that weren't there before. So I yelled for Checo to come and have a look with his letterscope, and he appeared panting and he said, ah, it's a line of tanks. The tanks were American, but the guns were aimed right at them. Castle was hit a few times. The most important one was, was the one on, on the top floor between the two windows. There was a direct hit. And that made us put anything we had out to indicate, do not shoot, we are prisoners and luckily they do, did understand the shelling from the approaching US tanks was quickly directed away from the castle and was turned on the town we could see the American army very professionally getting into town and having a look in every house 
everywhere, just in case there were some hidden arms or hidden soldiers and so on. They were like cats in their rubber boots, rubber soled and rubber heeled boots, silent and cautious with their guns ready. There was at one point a German civilian tried to walk across the bridge and he was challenged by the Americans at the far end of the bridge and he was given every opportunity of stopping but he wouldn't stop and just about where that person is on the bridge now he was shot and his body was left lying in the middle of the bridge for quite some time. After that of course um, we went down into the courtyard and the gate rather cautiously opened and there was an unmistakable uh, American helmet poked around the, the gate. And he was filthy and, and dirty from battle, steel helmeted and armed to the teeth. And he came in and we all cheered, but way, you see, we bet him. And he stopped, he was frightened. Now, he'd been through battle, battle uh, causes great stress even to veterans sometimes. And he was under stress, and there were all these mad people waving their arms and shouting at him, and he quickly took down his rifle, which had been on his, uh, he was holding over his shoulder, got this down and menaced us, you see, and said, Kate, stay back, stay back, he said. We saw our friends, you know. And then he relaxed, and some other soldiers came in, and it was all very jolly. But they weren't ready to go home just yet. High up in the roof of the chapel lay the completed parts of an aircraft waiting to be put together. Bill and I, before breakfast, we went up there, knocked a hole in the ceiling, brought it all down, and we, I was assembling one side and you were assembling the other. Your side went together perfectly. My side, I had to ask you to just pull two bits together while I put a bolt through. Now, none of those things had been fitted before. They hadn't been able to. So it shows how yes. accurate our work was. This is the only known photograph of what was christened the Colditz Cock, taken that day by an unknown GI. Jack and Bill proudly displayed the glider to their German guards and the Americans who'd arrived. It was left behind when three days later the prisoners were evacuated back to Britain. They never saw it again but rumour is that it was burnt after the war. Now, more than 50 years later, they will witness the rebirth of the Colditz Cock. Yes. Ah, good. Hang on, stop. We've met. We've met. The fabric's gone. Oh, dirty. Look, it's it's so smooth and shapely. It looks lovely, dear Bill, doesn't it? Well, it really does. We never thought we'd see a thing like that, did My we? God. But uh, that that material looks to be exactly right, doesn't it, to you? One bright colour. Marvellous idea. Jack, what it does look big enough to get in. Oh, yes. There's room there. Yes. There's a stick in the rider right at the end. Absolutely Tennis balls. German ones, aren't they? It's wonderfully made, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, it was seven and a half weeks, and the wings were built. Um, 60 miles away. Yeah. You've done a wonderful job on it, you really have. And look, this is the most important bit. Absolute luxury. I think we should have had the advantage with our launch up there because we had a good old diving start. Oh, yes. We? We could Providing we were under control. Well, from the word go. <laughs> Next thing is hopefully it will be in the air. And finally, the question of whether it would have flown can be answered. That's all out. Oh, oh, he's got the stick. Oh, 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 isn't that lovely? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need 40 feet to get off. <laughs> it was nothing. <laughs> 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 
Alan, so Chris Allen, Allen, 33 feet. <laughs> that was beautiful. He's cast off. Yeah. I never, never believed you'd get airborne as quickly as that. No. I can't see him, he's got so high. Quite through the points, I thought he's just a little bit. He really does. Thank you. Mate, I think he's enjoying himself. He doesn't seem to lose any height. <laughs> as if he's got a thermal over there. I thought he ought to have got it is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's it's long. long. Yeah. You can't find the bloody thing. So he's going to make a left-hand circuit and come back. Yeah, yeah. We've got to watch this bit. It'll happen yeah. very, very quick. Yes. I think we should have invited Pupka and, and uh, Eggers. Hold on, oh, oh, they should. <laughs> Perhaps they are watching. Perhaps they are. Never mind. And just kiss it. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, hey! Oh, you're going to have a whole Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs>